Facebook, and uh, we have uh, we have people in the class today. Baruch Hashem, that's what happens when you have a class at a decent time. Um, thank God for my my work schedule being uh, uh, permissible for that. All right, so Baruch Hashem, we're uh, we're engaged in the learning of the Holy Torah, and this week's parsha is Vayishlach. We tend to give a quick summary of the parsha. And then uh, go into detail. So let's uh, let's try to do that as best we can. Vayishlach uh, continues where last parsha ended, as would be expected. Uh, in last week's parsha, Yaakov leaves Lavan's house and he's on his way back home to his loving parents. Uh, when he meets up, where he hears about Asaph approaching with four hundred men, and Chazal tell us it's not just four hundred men, four hundred generals. Of, of, of armies. So we've got uh, 400 different like platoons of soldiers together with Esav coming to meet uh, poor uh, Yaakov with his, uh, with his uh, 11 sons, one daughter, uh, it's uh, four wives and uh, a whole group of animals. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's what Yaakov has to defend uh, himself with against uh, Esav's approach. And so uh, Yaakov does what is traditionally done ever since then in Jewish circles uh, to protect himself. He sends gifts. Bribery sometimes works. He prays. That always works. And he uh, he prepares for war because sometimes even when you pray, nevertheless, Hashem sends the challenge of war and we need to be prepared for that. Uh, probably uh, talk more about that in... Uh, in the Shabbat drasha this week. But uh, anyway, uh, Yaakov also wrestles with, with what uh, the Torah calls an ish, and Chazal mostly tell us that he, he fought with the angel of Esav, and he was victorious. His name is changed from Yaakov to Israel. He then later on meets Esav himself, and, uh, and they leave in peace. And Esav expects Yaakov to follow him back to Seir, back to Esav's home. And he doesn't. Yaakov doesn't. And instead, he goes and settles in a place called Shechem, where his daughter is uh, is, is taken, um, uh, taken by force. And uh, and he uh, he needs to do something about it. And instead, his sons, um, Shimon and Levi. Uh, basically uh, trick the town to, into uh, all getting uh, all the men to get uh, circumcisions. And when they're very, very weak and tired from the circumcision on the third day, when they're in the most pain, they come and basically slaughter the entire city, at least uh, the male population. Yaakov then leaves that place, builds an altar, which we'll talk about in a place called Beit El, uh, Beit Kel. And uh, and then Rachel passes away while giving birth to Binyamin, also in this week's parsha. And uh, Reuven does a very strange sin, which we talked about in previous years, of moving Yaakov's bed away from um, uh, away from one of the other tents and into the tent of his mother Leah. And this is a, this is the reason why this kind of impudence. Uh, whatever, what, whatever, whatever it is exactly that he did, we're not entirely sure. But uh, whatever it was is definitely worthy of him losing somehow the firstborn rights. He's no longer going to be considered the firstborn. We don't really hear very much about, you know, Reuven. The, he was literally the firstborn, uh, but uh, he he loses some of those rights, which is not unusual for us. We've seen Esau lose his firstborn rights and others. And so uh, Yitzchak passes away in this week's Parsha. He's 180 years old. He's buried in by, by, uh, by Yaakov and Esav in Marat And then the Torah concludes this week's Parsha with the sort of a list of the descendants of Esav and all of the kingdoms of the nations that he would begin, including uh, Edom and, uh, and the nations that came from there. All right, Baruch Hashem. Uh, the uh, that's what we have so far, uh, and then uh, let's get into the deeper dive into the parsha. I'm going to share the share the parsha sheet that I sent out in the email. If 
you have not received it, let me know, uh, because you should have received that as long, along with the questions that we're going to answer. The first question we're going to answer is, it seems simple. It seems like there shouldn't be a question at all. But uh, the, the, the Parsha is called Vayishlach because Yaakov sent something. It says, Vayishlach Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. Yaakov sent Malachim in front of him. El Esav Achiv to his brother Esav. Artsa Seir to the land of Seir, Sede Edom, which is in the land of, in the field of Edom. Seems simple. He sent Malachim, which we usually translate as angels. But really, Malachim isn't really, literally, angels. Malachim could be any kind of messenger. A Malach means messenger. A Malach Hashem, a, a, a messenger of Hashem, is indeed an angel. But saying that he's sending angels is not, uh, is, is not the only way to interpret this word, as we're about to see. So let's look at Rashi. And, I, and it's interesting because a, a lot of kids, a lot of children learn this parsha very early in their, in their schooling, in their Jewish uh, schools. And they learn this Rashi. It's a very easy Rashi. It is uh, perhaps an easy one to even memorize because it's really two words. And one of the words is in the commentary itself, in, in, the, uh, the, in, the, in the actual words in, in the verse. So let's see. Rashi says, "V'yishlach Yaakov Malachim." Rashi says, "Yaakov sent angels." The Torah says that Rashi. Uh, Rashi's quoting the Torah. It says, "V'yishlach Yaakov Malachim." Yaakov sent Malachim, and then Rashi says, "Malachim Mamash, actual Malachim." Okay. Rashi is answering a question. As is usual, Rashi is bothered by something, and here he's bothered by: Are we saying that he sent? angels or that he sent messengers and he answers the question very nicely he sent malachim mamash he sent actual literal and we're actually using the word literally literally correctly he's saying he's, he sent malachim literally malachim actual malachim which would be great if what he means is malachim are angels or Malachim are messengers, he sent literally that. But, as I point out to the kids uh, when, when, they, when they come home from school, usually in the, around fourth grade, fifth grade, or whatever, when they, when they learn uh, this Parsha, and they say, we learned this Rashi, that, uh, that Yaakov sent Malachim, and I say, how do you know those are Malachim? How do you know those are angels? How do you know, how do you know how to translate the word Malachim? You're, you're assuming that Rashi means angels, as even Safaria does, right? It says Hebrew, Malachim, angels, actually angels. So that's not true. Uh, he's, by the way, Rashi's source here is the Midrash in Bereshit Rabbah, which has a machloket there. There's an argument there about whether Yaakov sent angels or whether he sent messengers, human messengers. And it's not exactly clear. And if you look at some of the other commentaries, we're going to be even more confused. So let's look at the other commentaries. Let's look at Ibn Ezra, for instance. Ibn Ezra, as well as the Rashbam, uh, who are both, by the way, usually very literal in their translation of the Torah, they argue with Rashi. He says, Ibn Ezra, um, it says at the very, very last four words here, it says, Ve'ela ha-malachim heim avadav And he makes it very clear. Who did Yaakov send as these malachim? He sent his avadav, he sent his servants. That makes it very clear that according to Ibn Ezra, that these malachim were human messengers. Not angels. The Rashbam says the same thing. The Rashbam, uh, one of the uh, one of the Bali Tosfot, one of the uh, grandsons of Rashi, very very literal translation of a uh, commentary on the Torah. Um, he says also that these were actual human beings, and he proves it. Even he says they, as 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 can be clear from uh, 
from the uh, from the words later on, it's it's clear they didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know uh, they, they they had to be explained what to do. Angels don't need that kind of explanation. So comes along the Kliya car and he gives us a very very he gives us a summary of these arguments. He says Perish Rashi Malachim Amash. Uh, and he uh, he says that these are he says if you if you look at it carefully it seems very uh, from from the smichut of, of the parshiot from the connection of this verse to the previous verse it's pretty clear that he sent uh, angels that were uh, that were heavenly angels what do I mean so it says in the last few verses of the previous parsha uh, it says there in Vayetze. That the uh, that that Yaakov was was going, and he came to a place called Machanaim. We spoke about this last week and in previous years as well. He went to a place called Machanaim, and this place Machanaim, he saw Bo Vivgo Bo Malachi Elokim. He saw there uh, angels of messengers of Elokim, and that's clearly angels, right? Because that's like I said before, that's messengers of Hashem. What are messengers of Hashem? They have to be angels. That's a Malach, an angel. Uh, the uh, and, and and he says he gives other he gives a he gives some rabbinu bachaya that uh, that, that these are that these are that these are indeed angels and then he says something brilliant you know how you know that these are angels and not just regular messengers he says v'yesh lifarish shedayek meloshin lefanav what does it say look at the verse again. It doesn't say he sent messengers. It says it says messengers. Yaakov Malachim Lefanav. He sent messengers in front of him. You can't send your servants in front of you. They're not in front of you. They're behind you. They're your servants. They're beneath you. They're secondary to you. Your servants don't walk in front of you. That would be rude. Your servants are walking behind you. These malachim are lefanav, are in front of him, and that has to be angels. So that's the kliyakar explaining this Rashi again that these uh, that these angels, uh, that these messengers were indeed angels. And the way you know that Rashi is saying that they're angels is because we're talking about that they are angels from in front of him. There are other commentaries who point out that you could perhaps say that the word mamash in this Rashi, I forget who says this now, the word mamash, mem, mem, shin, could be malachim min hashamayim, messengers from heaven, and those would also be angels. And that's how you know that Rashi means that they're angels and not just messengers, so Safaria is not entirely wrong. Okay. So that's how we begin. Uh, again, he sent these malachim, he sent these angels in front of him, and there's midrashim about what happened there, that there was, there was a, a little bit of a fight going on with 87, these angels, etc. And Yaakov is afraid, nevertheless, that he might not be victorious against Esau. He prays to Hashem, as we said, and part of the wording of the prayer is listed in the Torah, Baruch Hashem. And what he says here is, Kantonti mikol ha-chasidim, ha-chasidim, mikol ha-emet asher asita et avdecha. I have katon, from the word katan. I have become little, I've become weakened. I've become smaller from all the kindnesses and all the truth that you have done to your servant. He means that Hashem, he's talking to Hashem. Hashem has done such kindness to him. That he feels less than uh, than than he was, and he feels he feels too weak from uh, from from all from all the kindness that, that Hashem has, sh- has shown him, and that's why he's afraid of this uh, this this visit from Esau. In other words, he doesn't feel he's worthy of being rescued because of the fact that he's become smaller. He's been his his merits have decreased. Says Rashi. 
right? So why why does he feel that way? What, what's what's like what what's happened in between like these fourteen years that he's been working for love on? Did something happen that he feels like his his merits have been diminished? He's been suffering in the hands of love on. He himself says so. He's been cheated left and right. He's been lied to. His uh, he, the the wife he wanted to marry uh, wasn't allowed to him at first. He's he's suffered quite a bit. So what does it mean that? He feels like he lost his merits. For, from what? But what great rewards has he received that he's lost his merits? So says Rashi, I feel like I've lost my merits from all the kindness that you've showed me. And that's why I'm afraid. Shema Mishehivtahtani as he quotes again from the Gemara in Shabbat 32, he says that you, you've given me promises, indeed, that I would be successful. That was all the way back at the beginning of Parshat Vayetze. Hashem promised him that he would take care of him. Right? That was the, 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 the famous uh, dream that Yaakov had with the ladder. And nevertheless, he feels that he's become uh, somehow weakened by his sins, by his misbehavior. Yaakov misbehaved. Where do you see that? We don't have any. We don't have any indication of Torah that Yaakov sinned. He did anything wrong. This seems to be that what this seems to be something that happened in these fourteen years. He feels somehow that he's no longer able. To uh, to earn Hashem's protection, even though Hashem promised him protection. By the way, there's a whole interesting discussion about how you could say such a thing. If Hashem promised you that you'd be protected, how could you possibly suggest that you wouldn't be protected? That you've lost that merit. Does that ever happen? Hashem promises protection and then takes it away. So the Gemara in several places says, "Yeah, in, we see that he does." If you've if he promises you something that's unconditioned that you earn it, that you behave in such a way as to earn Hashem's protection, you can lose all the uh, certain blessings. The same thing happens to the Jewish people. Right? The Jewish people are promised that good things will happen to them, only good. Yeah, and they're also promised that if they misbehave, they will lose that protection. So the answer is Rav Moshe Feinstein, in Darash Moshe. He quotes this pasuk, Katanti Mikoha Chesidim. He quotes the Rashi. And then he says, Hine Bishat Yitziat Yaakov Lecharan. The time that Yaakov went to Haran, he says, he saw, sorry, one second, one second. I'll tell you what he saw in just a moment. <laughs> Not to be in suspense till then. All right. That, he says that. Uh, that uh, it says that, like I said, at the time he was he was leaving to Quran, he saw the angels. He, he saw Hashem told him from the top of the ladder that he was going to give him shmira, that he was going to protect them. Now he's afraid. You think, do you think that perhaps this protection of angels isn't going to be enough? Shaira, maybe he thinks maybe he, he made some sort of mistake and then he, he lost the protection of Hashem. Lim came, Yesh Lano Lilmod Mizze, Kama Anutrikim, with the Og Alma, Hishtarash Lanu, Velo, Adaganu, Haganu. This teaches us. Yaakov is teaching us a very important lesson here, says Rabbi Moshe Feinstein. He's saying, if Yaakov is afraid that he sinned, and we know he didn't do anything wrong for 14 years, he was he he himself was mistreated. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't steal. He didn't cheat. He didn't lie. Right. 
uh, aside from the fact that he left Lavan without telling Lavan that he was leaving, and he didn't really have a choice in the matter because if he would have told him something, he would have gotten in trouble. Lavan wouldn't have let him leave. So aside from that, what do we see? What do we see Yaakov doing that's so bad? So if Yaakov is afraid, says Rav Moshe Feinstein, how much more so should we be afraid? You know, what we do in the course of a day, as good as we think we are, we know that we are not perfect. Right? Nobody's saying we should be perfect. But if Yaakov is afraid that he's lost all of his merits and he didn't do anything, how about us? You know? This is Rabbi Moshe Feinstein speaking, not me. All right? So every single person who's interested in being a Ben Torah, this doesn't, doesn't just mean somebody who's in yeshiva. A Ben Torah is somebody who wants to live a Torah lifestyle, right? A Ben Torah, right? So we have to hold on to our madrig. We have to hold on to our level. Uh, Yaakov is a different level. I get it. Of course, we're not expected to be like Yaakov. But if Yaakov is afraid on his level, that he messed up and he didn't do anything wrong, how much more so should we be careful? He brings uh, other, other places like uh, similar ideas. And the point is that even when, uh, even, even when we're, uh, even when somebody like Yaakov is surrounded by angels pr protecting him, he's still afraid that his, uh, his sins will get him. So we should also be concerned that no matter, uh, you know, we don't have to wait for, we don't have to wait for Yom Kippur to do Teshuva. We have to do Teshuva every night. And we have to think about where, where we're holding and how good we can be and, uh, and uh, be, be better. We can all, like everybody was saying a few, a few years ago, we can all do better, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to reappropriate that term. Um, uh let's uh let's skip to uh quite a bit let's skip the whole fight with the angel we've learned about that in previous years we've dealt with it in uh, all kinds of different contexts and uh we often miss the second half of the parsha so obviously yaakov like i said meets asav they part on good terms yaakov then goes to shechem in the city called Shechem, named after <laughs> named after the king's son, right? This is how much the king loves his son, and uh, and then the uh, and then this trick that the that Shimon and Levi do, they get the the inhabitants of Shechem to circumcise themselves uh, in order to bring back Dina from uh, from the basically uh, she was kidnapped and and raped. And they want to bring her back home. It says here, but he Yom Hashlishi was on the third day, Biotam Koavim, the day that they were uh, in pain. Bikushne Bene Yaakov, the two sons of Yaakov, Shimon Velevi, Achei Dina, the brothers of Dina. Chazal uh, point out they're called the brothers of Dina because they really acted like her brothers. This is what a brother is supposed to do, right? Uh, they took Ish Harbo, they each took his uh, weapon, Vo El Ha'ir, they went to the city, Betach, it's a question what, uh, to what this Betach refers, either, the, either the, the brothers were Betach, were confident, or the city was, uh, Rav, Hirsch, the way tra Rav Hirsch translates it, is Betach means the city was Betach, the city went to sleep thinking everything was hunky-dory, everything's safe, they just had a Brit, you know, they're, they're uh, <laughs> They're going to be all better on the fourth day, right? The Hargu Kol Zachar, they killed every male. Uh, then the Et Chamor, the Shechem, Beno, the Chamor, and Shechem, his son, Hargu Lefi Karav, they killed with the sword. Viku Et Dina, and they took the Dina, Mibet Shechem, Vietzeo. They took the, the Dina from the house of Shechem and they left. That's what it says. Asks the Maril Diskin. The Maril Diskin, we don't we don't uh, often have uh, we don't often have his uh, his commentary, but we should. 
uh, it's uh, he has a commentary on the Torah, and with some brilliant ideas there. And he writes that, uh, yeah, he he asks the question, what do we say just happened? Shimon and Levi this killed everybody, all the men of this town. Doesn't that include Hamor and Shem? Aren't they men in this town? So what, what, what do we need another verse for? And specifically, the whole verse isn't just like, and they also killed Hamor and Shem. It says they, they killed them by the sword, as opposed to, what, a gun? Of course they killed them by the sword. It said they took their swords. Right? It says, Shimon Levi, Achei Dina, Ish Karbo, they took, right? Vayikhu, right? They took their swords, they went and killed all the men, and then they killed Hamor and Shem by the sword. So obviously, this is supposed to, this verse is, there's no extra words in the Torah, as we've said many times. And so this verse is supposed to teach us something else, something further. And uh, it says the Maril Diskin, and I have this quoted from the uh, from the Talalay Orot, I think. Yeah, if, yeah, from the Talalay Orot, quotes this. Ma tam did yachi dibur miyuchad lehargitat shel shchem chamor. Why does the death of shchem and chamor have to be separately introduced? You know, like, uh, you know, when you invite your, your kids down to dinner and they, they don't come and you say, do you need a special invitation? So, so here, all the, all the men of the city of Shechem have been killed out. And then Hamor and Shechem need a special mention. Why? Isn't their name, uh, isn't their death included in the death of all the people of Shechem? So he asks the question. Maybe there's a difference, he says, between the death of all the men of Shechem and the death of Shechem, uh, of, uh, Shechem and Chamor. At Anshe Shechem, Hargu Shimon Velevi, Lolo, Kol Melchama, Lolo, Ma'amet. The death of all the men of Shechem, of the town, happened without any fight. Without any war. Why? As the Torah testifies, there's the death, there's the third day after their Mila. They were, they were weak, and they were in pain. They weren't able to defend themselves. They weren't able to fight. How is that different between Chamor and Shem? You have to go back a little bit. Uh, I don't have the, the verses in front of me now. But what happened was the brothers told Shem and Chamor that they would that they would happily let them marry Dina as long as they become circumcised. And then the next ver few verses talk about how they went and convinced their great salesmen. They went and convinced the people of Shechem to circumcise themselves. The Jewish people will live with them. They'll make a lot of money, right? As usual, Jews are obviously good in business. Every Jew but this one, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so uh, the uh, so they're, they're really good salesmen, and then all the all the people of Shechem circumcise themselves. So what the Maril Diskin is saying here is this. They convinced those people that may have circumcisions, but they had their circumcisions first. Shem and Hamor had themselves circumcised first. Harigatam lo haita kala karigat anshe ha'ir. Their death was not as easy as the death of the people of the city. They had to have a fight with them. They really had to fight them by sword. That's why the Torah says, 
that they that they killed them by sword. Now they had a sword fight. It was a whole action scene in the killing of Hamor and Shechem. Right? Veniskar Harigatam Shechem Hamor mentions their death. Who bitui she'enu mufia elam b'muhamah? They they died by by with a fight. The Kamarza says in other places. Kita et kol's chura lefikharif. Where it talks about where people died by 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 fighting, they died in battle. Uses the term lefikharif. Lefikharif doesn't mean they they died by sword. It means they died by sword fight. They fought. They fought back. They were able to. It says lefizem uvor haposukative. We can now explain the the verse very well. Tchila yavo al irveyergu kol zachar. First, they went and killed all the all the males of the city. Hariga stam. They just killed them. They killed them flat. Right? They had no. There's no pushback. Lelo milchama at all. There was no fight at all. Shechem shechen achul acholim lelo gili kol hani hatin nagl. They couldn't give a. They, they couldn't give a fight back. Ulam et Chamor veShchem beno, but when it comes to Chamor and his son, Asher lo hayu cholim, cholim, they weren't sick, they weren't in pain. Hargulafi charev, they had to be killed by sword fight. Shechen nilachmu atem ad sheikiu b'hem rak az shenitzichu et Shechem et Chamor vichu et Dina bebeit Shechem vitzu. So that's why it has to mention them separately because it was a separate kind of fight. It wasn't the same thing. It wasn't that they came and massacred the place like they did with Shechem. And I know that's controversial too. We've spoken about that, I believe, in previous years. But this particular part of the fight, this was an actual uh, back and forth. And sounds like it had it's to be good done for a Hollywood. Right you had a okay. question? I thought it sounds good to be a Hollywood movie, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this could be a, a scene in a movie for sure. Is there any commentary on like Ruvain and Yehuda not joining in? Uh, yes, uh, there, there's a lot of commentary. Um, the short version is uh, the, the brothers afterwards uh, came in and joined in with the pillaging of the city which is also controversial and worth discussing. I think we discussed that in previous years as well. And obviously the other brothers include uh, Reuven and Yehuda, but um, Shimon and Levi have that kind of personality. And that's what, uh, that's what Yaakov mentions when he's quote unquote blessing them in Parshat Vayechi, uh, that Yehuda and, and Reuven don't do these things. That's why they're worthy of being leaders. They, th- th- this is not a good quality that they that they went and did this um, somehow. Somehow it's not a good thing. In, in some ways it's a very good thing, and the Torah seems to praise them. They're the brothers of Dina because this is what brothers should do, right? But on the other hand, uh, they're, they're cursed, whether it's because they, they did it sort of uh, uh, by trickery or, uh, or they, you could say, and again, we have to be very careful about um, criticizing the, uh, the these are the shift they call these are the the uh, the heads of the Jewish people these are these are the, the, the symbolize Jewish people for all time so it's very hard to be critical of them however it's worth mentioning that um, how do you say this politely uh, they tricked the people of Shem. And that trickery was it necessary, you know? To, were were they? How confident were they about Hashem helping them if they were doing the right thing? They could, they didn't have to do they didn't have to do it by by tricking them. You know, am I frozen? Oh, I, I saw myself no. frozen for a second. I didn't oh, see you shaking first. my head, but I'm not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, there. Uh, <laughs> all right. Anyway, uh, there's uh, quite a bit to say on these next few verses. Uh, so let's uh, let's get right into it. Uh, 
We're going to go all the way to chapter 35. Chapter 35, verses 6 to 15. Yes, we're going to have to, we have to read all of them uh, because there's, uh, as you'll see, there's some interesting uh, points here, I think. Ve'avo Yaakov Luza. Yaakov went to a place called Luza, not, not the English word. Asher uh, Eretz Kanan, Eretz Kanan. He bait Kel. It's in the place called Beit Kel. Hu ha'am asher imon. This is an all, uh, all of the nation that is him, uh, all the nation that is with him. The even Sham is Beach. He built a an altar there. Vikra l'makom Kel Beit Kel, and he named the place Kel Beit Kel. Remember that name. Kisham Niglu Allah Helokim, that's where Hashem revealed himself to him. Bechar Bevarcho Lifne Achiv made him successful against his uh, brother. But Tamat Devora, Mineket Rivka, and there's a, a sort of parenthetical note that the uh, that the nursemaid of Rivka, Devora, she died. We didn't even know she lived, she was never mentioned before. Uh, and she was buried under Beit Kel, alone, under a tree, alone, and that tree, or that area, I guess, was named the, the tree of crying, the weeping tree. Beautiful. Not the whomping willow, but the weeping tree. Uh, maybe the weeping willow. Anyway, and Hashem saw him again on his way to Padan Aram, that's where he's going, and he blessed him. And Hashem told him, your name is Yaakov, don't call that Shimcha Od, don't call your name at all anymore Yaakov. Your name is Yisrael. He called his name Yisrael. By the way, we don't have it here. We've learned in previous years. Who called him Yisrael? Was it Hashem? No, originally it was that Ish that he wrestled with, that man, quote unquote, that angel of Esau, like we said before, that he wrestled with, called him Yisrael. Here Hashem is sort of seconding that opinion. I second that emotion. I'm going to also call you, don't call your name Yaakov anymore, call it Yisrael. We're going to have some commentary on that. Relax. I'm sure you have questions about this. I am Kel Shakai. Pray, Reve, should be fruitful and multiply. Goy, Kahal, Goyim, Yeh, Mimeka. You'll be a great nation. Uh, great nations will come from you. Melachim, Mechalatzecha, Yetzeu, great kings will come from you. And the land that I gave to Avram and Yitzchak, I'm giving to you, and to your seed, after you, I will give this land. And Hashem left him from the place where he spoke to him. Yaakov built a matseva, a platform, a worshiping platform there, Makom Asher Diber Ito, a place where he talked to Hashem, Metzevet Even, he placed a stone, Yasech Alecha, Nesech, he anointed it, Vitzok Alecha Hashem, and he poured oil on it. And here's where we get to the important point. The Kra Yaakov at Shem Hamakom Asher Diber Ito, and he named this place where Hashem spoke to him. Uh, uh, that Hashem spoke to him there. He called it what? Beit Kel. What do you find interesting about that naming? Was that name beforehand or no? Is this the first name? Yes, it's the same exact name. Let's look back to verse 9, like I said we would. Uh, or, uh, verse 6. Right, we have Yaakov Luza. He went to Luza, the land of Canaan, to a place called Beit Kel, right? And he named the place. He put his he put him his back there, and he called the place Kel Beit Kel, Beit Kel Bethel, right? Is what the, the English translation is, right? So, and then Hashem spoke to him later in another place, 
And Yaakov called that place Beit Kel. There's a lot of places called Bethel. Wait, okay? what, isn't the place where he saw the ladder? And it's a different that place. That's Har Beth, Maria. Wasn't that Basel too? Or am I? I don't think so. <laughs> okay. I have to look it up, but I, I don't think so. Not off the top of my head. Um, but uh, Benji thinks it was Basel or Kim. I thought the I thought the place where he had the dream was like Har Maria. Yes, I agree. Yeah. yeah. Don't they say that like that was also? I don't know. I went to I went to see um the Winters, and they were like, "This is where the ladder with Yaakov is," and they lived in they Beth. I don't know. Not but, sure. Uh, you'd have to ask them. But uh, let's. Uh, for now, let's ask some questions about this verse. So you already asked the question about uh, why is he calling seemingly two different places the same name? That's worth asking. By the way, it shouldn't be uh, just push it shot for a moment. It shouldn't be so unusual. It is possible to name this one place to name uh, to name two places with the same name. There's like a San Diego, Texas. Is it San Diego, California? Is it San Diego probably in uh, Mexico? Yes. Oh, so Benji found out it is ba Beth Kel there too oh, yeah? with the ladder. In Vayetze? Yeah, what Pasuk in her? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Now you're making me look this up. No, no, I, I just think it's like maybe he just wasn't original with his ideas of names. Like, okay, God's everywhere. Let's call it House of God. Everywhere. Yeah. But right, well, keep, keep keep going. Ulam Luz Shema Ir the Rishona. It was this place is called Luz. Isn't there Luz right it's here? It's the same place. Ah, he has no, he's not, he's uh he likes the same name. He, he came to Luz. Luza, right? We have a Yaakov Luza, Asher Be'eretz Kanan, he Beit Kehahu. That's, that's that place. He went back to that place. Okay. Sorry. You're right and I'm right. <laughs> We're both right. Okay. Uh, anyway, so... Either way, he calls this other place Beit Kel, seemingly. We'll get to that in a moment. First, let's look at this other thing. And I think you were going to ask a question when we read this. The verse makes it very clear. Hashem tells Yaakov, do not call yourself Yaakov anymore. From now on, your name is Yisrael. Call yourself Yisrael. Don't call yourself Yaakov. Got it, Yaakov? Wait a minute. <laughs> Should have said, got it, Yisrael, right? Once Hashem changes somebody's name, you don't call that person by another name ever again. So, for example, Avraham, he was originally Avram. Hashem changed his name to Avraham. And we're not supposed to call him Avram anymore. Yaakov, we see, we call Yaakov still. Sometimes he's Yaakov, sometimes he's Yisrael, sometimes we're B'nai Yisrael, sometimes we're B'nai Yaakov. We're talking about Yaakov, the same guy. Why does he still have that name if Hashem said, don't call yourself that anymore? Good question. So let's look at the holy, oh, holy, or Hachaim, or Hachaim HaKadosh. Not too many people called HaKadosh. Or Hachaim was one of, I can think of three, perhaps. Uh, the Shlo HaKadosh, or Hachaim HaKadosh, yeah. So anyway, so Tzarek Lidat, we have to discover, we have to figure out what's the difference between Yaakov and Avraham. Ki Avraham Avraham over Ba'ase. The Gemara says in Brachot, Yud Gimel Amud Aleph, 13a in Brachot, it says somebody who calls Avraham Avram is sinning, is over an Anase, should get whipped. Aval HaKorel Yisrael Yaakov ain't over. You call Yisrael Yaakov, it's no problem. Vagam Shirazal, even the rabbis, Amruki Yaakov Adarekra. Even the the rabbis. 
called Yaakov, Yaakov from that point on. And they asked this question also. That was a, that was a rabbi's question. Shalot Razal Amruki Yaakov Adarikra Lamolo Lilmod Mimasha Adari Yaakov Hagam Amar Bo Lo Yikra Adari Kamo Kain Avram. So why are we still able to call Yaakov Yaakov? We're not able to call Avram Avram anymore. All right. So great question. Well, this is a, a rather short piece for the Orachim, by the way. I think we'll have time for all of it. He says, "Vulai kilitzad hashishina Hashem devaro hatov haamor biYaakov mehaamor beAvraham." Maybe it's because maybe we're treating Yaakov differently than Avraham because Hashem changed his word wording that he used with Avraham. Hashem doesn't speak about Yaakov the same way he speaks about Avraham. What do I mean? That, that which he says, your name is Yaakov, is not something that he says with Avraham. He doesn't say, Shimcha Avram. He says, your name is Shimcha Yaakov. Your name, which your name is Yaakov, is not going to be Yisrael. He doesn't say to Avram, your name, your name is Avram. That phrase, your name is Avram, he doesn't say with Avraham. He didn't have to say this. Why does it, what's the Kiddush in saying? What, what, what's the why, why did the verse even have to say that? You could say that entire verse and it would make a hundred percent sense without mentioning that your name is Yaakov. So why does it have to say it? The reason he says it is because that is your name, Kavua. That is your set name. Yaakov, your name is Israel, but your name is always going to be Yaakov. It was Yaakov, it will always be Yaakov. It's Kavua. It's set. He didn't mean, Hashem didn't mean for his name to not be Yaakov anymore. But we need to figure out why it is that Hashem has a, a, a different uh, reason, seemingly, for changing one person's name than another person's name. It has to be that there's a good reason. And the reason is because a person's name fits the person's neshama, fits a person's nefesh. There's a verse in uh, the, the that uh, um, in Tehillim 46.9 that the rabbis in the Gemara and Brachot, all the way in the beginning of Brachot 7b, Say that it it, uh, it says says al uh, tikrish shamot el shemot. Hashem gives us our names. There's some sort of prophecy that gives us our Hebrew names. Our Hebrew names fit us perfectly. Hine Yaakov haya shem nefesh haitalo, and Yaakov was his original name. That is his soul's name. That's a, that's the name that was given by Yitzchak. Some say even maybe by Hashem. I'm not going to go there now. All right. Either way. That's why he has to get an additional level of neshama by getting the name Yisrael. In other words, he's different from Avram. Avram, his name was changed to Avraham, and that was him. That was, that was his entire essence. Yaakov's essence is always going to be Yaakov. It's Kavua, it's set. And he gets an additional soul. 
Think of Yaakov as a person with two souls. And that soul's name is Israel. He's a completely different person. He's a people. He's multiple. He has a different ruach, a different neshama. It doesn't affect his first one. The first one doesn't get lost. It doesn't get hurt. His first soul of Yaakov is still inside him. And along with that first soul, he gets a second separate soul. And that's why he's still called Yaakov. And his name should not be completely taken out. He continues, and now that we understand this about Rashi, uh, about Yaakov, he can, the Orachim continues, that's not the same as regards to Yaakov. And he, he brings, uh, there's, he says there's a hint to this in Diver Hayamim, um, in the very beginning, actually, of Diver Yamim, in, uh, in, in chapter 1, verse 27. That's not right what it says here in Safari. It's not Aleph Aleph. Uh, oh, it's chapter, it's chapter Aleph. But it's uh, verse 27. In uh, the first Diver Hayamim, it says, Avraham hu Avraham. Kapizah amr lo yikare shimcha od. He can't call his, he can't call his name Avraham anymore. Because he is now not Avram anymore. He is Avraham completely, as opposed to uh, as opposed to Yaakov, who is now also Yisrael. Now let's get to the next question we had. Why is he calling this place uh, two different uh, two two different places the same name? We go to Rav Hirsch, who says Mako Diber Ito. He says from the continuation it appears that this place where God revealed Himself to Yaakov, the second place, is not the same place that was previously called Beit Kel. If nevertheless we learn in verse fifteen that Yaakov called this place too Beit Kel, his intention apparently was to stress that God's presence is not attached to any particular place. Wherever a man is found who is worthy of God's presence, that place is sanctified, and there a Beit Kel is built. Beit Kel means a house of Kel, the house of God. Every place can be a house of God. He's going from place to place, and every place he sees God, that place becomes Beit Kel. This idea is specifically emphasized by the adding clause, ito. God rose away from him at the place where he had spoken to him. He, Yaakov, not the place, was the basis and the condition of the re- for the revelation of God's presence. God didn't speak to him from the place. Hashem spoke to him for him at that place, at that place too. But in any place, Hashem can show himself anywhere. Any place can be holy. There's some places that are more ruy, that are more fitting for holiness. No question about it. But any place can become holy. It just needs us to make it holy. All right, last uh, last piece here. We're a little over time, I know, but uh, um, we started a little late. So if you need to go, I understand. But uh, very quick here. We'll, we'll try to be we'll try to be fast. How fast? I don't know, but we'll try. Uh, we we want to hear some holy words from the chida. He writes, he asks the question. Like I said, the last part of the Parsha deals with the names of Esau's descendants and his family. And it says uh, he married this woman by the name of Basmat Bat Yishmael Achot Nevayot. He is very specific about who this person is. She's the daughter of Yishmael. She's the sister of Nevayot. And her name is Basmat. Easy, right? Uh, nothing to comment on, right? Well, there's a little bit of a problem. And that is, if you go back, and I even have the verse here for you, if you go back, all the way back to the family of Yishmael, and, uh, and Esa, uh, who Esav married, way back at the end of uh, Vayetze, it says, Esav went to Yishmael, 
Machalat Bat Yishmal. He took Machalat, the daughter of Yishmal, Ben Avraham, Achot Nevayot, the sister of Nevayot, Al Nashav, Lo Lisha. He took her as his wife. Easy. No problem, right? Machlat, the daughter of Yishmael, the sister of Nevayot. We got this, right? No problem. Machlat, that's her name, right? Machlat it is. We can go on. But that's not what it says because her name is not called Machlat in this week's Parsha. Her name is called Basmat. The sisters? Machlat and Basmat are not the same name. Are the sisters? Maybe, but oh. it doesn't say that. It says the daughter of Yishmael, the sister of Nevayot, but it doesn't say the sister of Basmat, the sister of Machlat, and it doesn't say with Machlat, the sister of Basmat. It says the sister, the sisters of Nevayot, whoever that is. So says the Chumat Anoch, and it's a longer piece, but I cut it down to what we need here. We have Shalom Romes Ki Mi. He says that the Torah is regarding the same person. They're not sisters. Sorry. Sorry, Shandel. According to the Chomet Anoch, they're not uh, they're not uh, they're not sisters. They are the same person, literally the same person. And the Torah has different names for them. And the Torah calls her uh, uh, Machlat earlier and calls her Basmat now. Why? Because when Esav took Machlat as a wife, what happens when somebody gets married? We learned about this last year in the. Uh, Jewish life cycles class when you when you get married you are a chozer b'tishuva all of your sins are forgiven you're a brand new person and you can start all new so when Esav took Machad as a wife his sins were forgiven it's like everybody else when they get married. So Machala comes to the word machal from from being mochel. From forgiveness, right? The nikrat machlat, right? The pasuk aku the mardu v'shol lochein karo hakatuf basmat, but now it's calling her name basmat because Esav, even though he did teshuva by marrying her, he was forgiven for his sins. That all went back as soon as he went back to his old ways. Teshuva is not a permanent uh, state. Teshuva is a process. And his process ended when he went back to how he behaved. And the, now her name now is Basmat, not Rikun Shav Met. If you look at the name Basmat, look at it carefully. What you'll see is the end is Met, death. And the first two letters, Bet and Shin backwards is Shav, which means he returned back to his old ways of sinning, and therefore he was a dead man walking, which is what we call people who sin. People who sin are considered to say Chazal. They're considered to have been dead even in their life. They are their 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 lives are almost worthless. They don't have the light of Hashem, all of the spirituality that they can achieve, all the great things all the great potential that is hidden in their neshama, regardless of what their name is, all of that can go away and go boop and be gone if they decide to live their life in a non-glorious way, in this uh, in the, the way of uh, Esau. We need to learn from Esau not to behave like him, not to go back when we have an opportunity to do teshuva, whether it's Rosh Hashanah or like we said earlier, every single day of the week, every single night when we do teshuva and try to become better people. We always have that potential. We have it within us. We have great potential. We should not lose it. We should not squander it like Esav did. We should live life like Yaakov did and only see the good in our lives 
and go from place to, to from elevation to elevation, become so holy that not, not only will we, will we will we be B'nai Yisrael, but every place where we will set our foot will be a Beit Kel. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop the live stream to Facebook. If you have any questions, I do have time to answer a few. Uh, otherwise, you'll have to put them in the comments down below and on the YouTube channel. Thank you very much.